Good evening, everyone. We want to take the opportunity at the outset to welcome you to the Sovereign Grace Advent Testimony March monthly meeting. We're very, very thankful that you have been able to join us this evening, and we want to assure you that we do appreciate your support and your prayers, uh, both for these meetings and for the testimony, the work of the testimony as a whole. The opening hymn this evening are the words, My times are in thy hands. My God, I wish them there. Just to remind you that the words will come up uh, on the screen. And we do want to encourage you, as we do each month, uh, to sing along uh, in the worship of these great uh, gospel hymns. So the opening hymn, My times are in thy hands. We're going to just seek the Lord together in prayer. We want to commit the meeting, especially into his hand, uh, the broadcast as it goes forth this evening. Uh, The Lord's servant as he'll bring the message, uh, praying that the Lord will use him and speak through him uh, to all of our hearts. We encourage you to pray as well. We need your prayers. So just wherever you are, lift your heart to the Lord and pray for his blessing. So let's just seek the Lord together. Heavenly Father, we bow in thy presence. Thank you for the throne of grace. We rejoice, Father, that the way is always open for us. We're glad that we can approach thee. We we feel, Father, our need. We do confess our weakness. We pray for the power of God. We pray for the fullness of the Holy Ghost. 
We want to know, Father, that anointing of which your word speaks. You have told us that you'll give the Holy Spirit to them that ask thee. We're asking that the Spirit of God will come down upon this meeting. We want, Father, just now in prayer to give the meeting and the broadcast into your hands. We want to pray for your blessing uh, to be upon it. We remember the cry of uh, your servant, uh, Jabez of old, O oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coasts. And Lord, we're asking tonight uh, that you'll bless this broadcast. We pray that you'll bless everyone uh, that is tuned in to listen uh, to the message uh, from God's word. We want to ask, Father, we'll all receive a, a great blessing uh, from your hand. We remember that in those words, Jabez said that you would bless me indeed, praying for an unusual, an extraordinary blessing. Grant us that this evening, Father. We ask that we would hear your speaking voice. We want to pray for your blessing to rest upon the ministry of the Sovereign Grace Advent Testimony. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness, your provision. Thank you for maintaining this work uh, now for uh, over a hundred years. We can say it's the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. We're conscious that its witness and its ministry is more relevant than ever as we see many of the great uh, events of the end time unfolding, even before our eyes. And Lord, we ask thee, give us understanding uh, of your word, and we pray that among the Lord's people there will be a greater interest in the prophetic scriptures, a greater interest in the coming again of the Savior. Your word speaks of those that love uh, the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, deepen our love. We, we think of the great hope we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Your word says that when we see all these things begin to come to pass, that we're to look up because our redemption draweth nigh. And Lord, we want to pray, help us ever to keep our eyes upon the Savior. Amidst all the discouragement, uh, all the darkness, the wickedness of the days in which we live, we pray, Father, that You'll enable us all to live every day looking on to Jesus, the one that is the author and the finisher of our faith. And we do thank you, Father, for the Bible. We praise thee today for your word. We ask thee to deepen our, our love for it. This book that is a lamp to our feet, a more sure word of prophecy, as a light that shineth in a dark place. And Lord, we thank you for the book that you've given to us to guide us uh, through this world, through our lives and especially through these dark uh, end-time age. And Lord, we want to pray, open up the Word of God to us, even in uh, the meeting uh, this evening. We ask thee, Father, to remember the testimony uh, of God, the gospel across the earth. We pray, Father, that you'll bless it and prosper it. We ask that wherever your servants are faithful to thee, to the gospel, to the blood and to the book, that you'll encourage them and use them and we pray, Father, that even among uh, the ministers in our own land and uh, across the world, we pray there will be a greater love uh, for the, the theme of the second coming of the, the Savior, a greater desire even to preach and to teach uh, upon uh, these great subjects. So, Father, hear our cries. So we just commit ourselves to thee now, confessing that we need the help of God and praying that you'll be with us in all that we would do. We ask thee to remember uh, especially uh, the Reverend Knowles, as he will bring the word of God. Lord, give him liberty, give him utterance. And our prayer would be that you'll make him a channel of blessing, an instrument even in your hand. We offer these our prayers to thee. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to come to the reading of God's word. We encourage you to take the scriptures and to follow in the reading. Uh, we're turning to the Old Testament it's 2 Samuel chapter 24. We're going to begin to read at the verse 10 of the chapter. We're reading together down to the end of verse uh, 21. So 2 Samuel chapter 24, the verse 10. And let us hear the word of the Lord uh, to our hearts. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly. And that I have done. 
And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet God, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So God came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return uh, to him that sent me. And David said unto God, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent the pestilence upon Israel from the morning, even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan, even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Arana the Jebusite. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people. And said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And God came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. And David according to the saying of God, went up as the Lord commanded. And Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arana went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Arana said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. So just ending the reading there, the close of verse 21, and we pray the Lord will follow with his blessing. That's the public reading uh, of his word. We just want to take the opportunity to uh, make the necessary announcements uh, on behalf of the Sovereign Grace Advent Testimony uh, Committee. We want to thank all who have joined us uh, for the monthly broadcast. Uh, we want to emphasize that we do appreciate uh, very much you taking the time to listen uh, to the service uh, online uh, today. We welcome all our viewers uh, wherever uh, you're listening from. And we know that there are those listening from uh, other countries uh, across the earth. And uh, we do appreciate that. We know sometimes that it's not straightforward uh, particularly thinking of the, the time differences. But we do want you all to know that we uh, appreciate you taking the time uh, to listen to the broadcast today. It is our earnest prayer as a committee that the Lord will uh, bless these meetings. They've been running now for many years, taking on a new format uh, since the restrictions of the lockdown. But we pray the Lord will bless uh, these meetings even at this time, bless them in a greater way. And we pray the Lord will bless the message from his word. That is uh, the all-important part of the meeting, the going forth of the truth of God. So we pray the Lord will bless uh, the message as it goes forth uh, today. Just to remind you of our quarterly magazine, uh, the latest edition of The Watching and Waiting is available. This is the April uh, to June 2021 uh, edition. To highlight that there is uh, an article by Dr. Douglas, uh, which he has kindly prepared and is published in this edition. It's on the study of uh, the Arava 
region in the land of Israel, including its uh, prophetic significance. So we do want to commend uh, the magazine uh, to you. We'd like it to have a very wide circulation. If you're, you're not signed up to receive it, contact our secretary. And we do bring your attention uh, to this latest edition uh, and to all of the material uh, that is contained uh, within it. We also like at these meetings to make you aware of uh, our latest publications. Remember that we have a full stock of literature. Uh, there is uh, a list that's available of all of the literature uh, that we have. You can receive that from uh, our secretary. I want to make you uh, aware of some of uh, our latest uh, editions. Remember that the, uh, the bound volume, uh, the latest bound volume of Watching and Waiting, this is volume 29. It covers the years 2017 to 2020. Uh, it costs nine pounds. It's good to have uh, the bound volumes. There is a special offer uh, that any three of the bound volumes, you can have uh, three of this particular edition, volume 29, or some of the previous ones, but uh, any three bound volumes uh, you can have for 20 pounds. Uh, so that's a very good offer uh, indeed. We encourage you to consider that. Remember Mr. Foster's uh, message on where are we in God's prophetical calendar? Uh, very relevant uh, for these days. Uh, been published. Uh, it's available to you free of charge. Remember Miss Guy's uh, little booklet, Concordance uh, to Prophecy, and also the booklet on Europe uh, entitled Where is Europe uh, Heading? Uh, these were messages that were previously printed in the watching and waiting, and they're now all available together just in this uh, little booklet. Uh, both Miss Guy's uh, booklet and uh, the Europe booklet are £1.50 each, or you can have five uh, for £5 or 20 uh, for £15. We have some special offers there because we want to encourage wider circulation. If you'd like a quantity to distribute uh, in your church, or to your friends and to your family. So remember that all of the publications are available from our secretary, uh, Mr. Stephen Toms. His details are found uh, on the magazine, his contact details. You can also find those on our website, www.sgat.org. And there's a full list of the publications on our website and you're able to purchase uh, the books uh, from the website uh, as well. Just to, to remind you, to make you aware that the next meetings, uh, the next monthly meetings, uh, will be the Spring Conference. Uh, that will be held on Friday the 23rd of April uh, 2021. Remember that there's always two meetings at the conferences. So the meetings will be broadcast, uh, will be continuing to broadcast uh, for the foreseeable future. We'll make you aware if there's any change of that. Uh, the meetings in April will be broadcast at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, the subject of the afternoon is the testimony of Elisha, and the subject in the evening is the testimony of uh, Ezekiel. Uh, the speaker at both of those meetings is the Reverend Brian McClung. Mr. McClung is a member of the Sovereign Grace Advent Testimony Council, and also the minister of the Newton Abbey, a free Presbyterian church in uh, Northern Ireland. His ministry is always a blessing. You remember that he spoke at the Spring Conference last year. Those messages uh, were put into print and are available if you would like uh, to have printed copies of them. We ask you to plan to join with us uh, next month again. And we would ask for your help just in making uh, the meetings known. Make these broadcasts uh, widely known. Uh, among your friends and uh, your family. Just for a few minutes, by way of uh, Chairman's remarks, I'd like to turn you in the Scriptures to Acts chapter 3 and uh, the words of the verse 21. Let me just read that verse to you. Speaking about the Lord Jesus, it says, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world uh, began. I want to emphasize the words there in the middle of the verse, uh, which God hath spoken 
by the mouth of all his holy prophets uh, since the world uh, began. I want to emphasize to you the importance of reading all of the Word of God. It's sad that many Christians uh, never read consistently uh, through the Bible. In fact, it's very sad that some Christians have never read the whole Bible uh, even once. And I'd like to challenge you uh, about that uh, today. It's important to read all of the revelation uh, that God has uh, given uh, to us. It's a sad thing uh, that some Christians pick and choose uh, the passages from God's Word uh, that they read. There are some people that just read through the Psalms, some Christians that just read through uh, the New Testament, and there are passages from the Scripture uh, that some Christians uh, avoid. And they avoid those passages uh, to their own detriment. Uh, they are p the poorer spiritually uh, for doing so. I want to encourage you to think of reading through the prophetic scriptures. Uh, th those are uh, portions of the Word of God that some Christians would uh, naturally steer away from. Uh, they find them very hard. Uh, they find them uh, very difficult. These words that we have uh, chosen just to, to dwell upon for a moment or two, uh, that God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. Th this series that we're currently engaged in in the monthly meetings is based upon uh, this verse uh, of Scripture. I want to highlight it to you. Remember, this is the second year that we have been bringing to your attention the testimony uh, of the prophets. Uh, we went through them last year and again continuing through this uh, theme uh, this year. And I want to emphasize uh, to you just what has been uh, spoken of here. God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. Remember, God speaks to us through his word. That's true of the prophets as well. God speaks to our hearts through the message of the prophets. God has something to say to you uh, from the prophets uh, of the Old Testament scriptures. So you ought not uh, to neglect them, uh, brethren and sisters. So I want to challenge you about that. I want to encourage you uh, to give special attention uh, to the prophetical uh, scriptures. What we're told here is about the Lord Jesus. The prophets speak about the Lord Jesus, whom the heavens must receive until uh, the times of restitution of uh, all things. It's speaking about uh, the Lord Jesus. Uh, a little earlier, the previous verse, he shall send Jesus, which before was preached unto you. So it's talking about the Savior coming again. He shall send Jesus, the coming again of the Savior. And, and the prophets speak about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. At present, the Lord Jesus has ascended up to heaven. He's seated at the Father's right hand. And he's going to stay there, continue in the heavens until the time of his second coming. It speaks here, until the time of the restitution of all things. So I want you to see that, men and women. The, pr the prophets have much to say to us about the Lord Jesus. And the prophets have much to say to us about the coming again of the Lord Jesus. The prophets have much to say to us about the time of the coming again of the Lord Jesus, whom the heavens must receive until the times. And it, it speaks of the restitution of all things. This is what the Lord Jesus is going to do uh, when he comes again. There's going to be a restitution of all things. He's going to restore this world to the way it was prior to, to the fall, to the entrance of sin into uh, this world. That's what's going to take, take place. And that's what the world is going to be like. Uh, during his thousand-year reign uh, upon the earth. And the prophets teach us and speak to us and reveal to us uh, what, what will actually happen, what that change uh, will uh, be like. So I want to encourage you, men and women, to think of this. And this is one of the reasons uh, why we have been engaged in this study and why we have continued it now for a second year. The importance of considering the teaching of the prophets with regard to the second coming uh, of 
uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So pray that might be a challenge uh, to your heart, a challenge to you to read through all of the Bible and not to neglect the prophetical parts, not, not to, to, to neglect the reading and the studying of what the prophets themselves have to say. There's much uh, to learn. That's one of the reasons why there's uh, so much ignorance abroad today on the subject of the second coming, because some of the major passages that teach us about these things are neglected uh, by the people uh, of God. So pray the Lord will bless uh, these few remarks uh, to your hearts uh, today. Our speaker this evening is the Reverend Philip Knowles. Uh, Mr. Knowles is the minister of the Free Presbyterian Church in Lewis, uh, down in the south of England. We want to encourage you uh, to pray for our brother and his family as they live and labour there. Our brother has been labouring uh, down in Lewis now faithfully uh, for over three years. He's doing a great work. Uh, the Lord has blessed his labours and encouraged him uh, in his work there. So we do ask you to pray uh, for the Reverend Knowles. Pray the Lord will send in others uh, to Jarrah Chapel. Pray that he'll be greatly used in the winning of souls and in the building up of uh, God's people there. Our brother's subject this evening is the testimony uh, of God. We're looking forward to his message. But just before he comes to speak, uh, we're going to sing again. We're going to have another hymn. Uh, the hymn is Take the World uh, but give me Jesus, all its joys are but uh, a name. So let's join together now just uh, in the singing of, of our second hymn.
extend to you another welcome in the Saviour's name. I would like to thank uh, also uh, Mr. Toms for the invite tonight uh, to bring forth God's word and also for the chairman Mr. McMillan for leading the meeting and doing all that he has done uh, for uh, the Sovereign Grace Advent Testament. And we pray that God will bless the labours as God's word uh, does go forth. Uh, I will not read uh, a portion really of scripture uh, as that's already been done uh, we will go through uh, this portion uh, in detail bit by bit and so what we want to do as we think about the testimony of God we'll just unite our hearts together this is a wonderful chapter this is a, a blessed chapter a chapter that you could spend weeks and weeks uh, going over and so there's so much here and I'm going to look at it tonight from the testimony of God so we pray that God will give help and uh, draw near at this time. So we'll look to God now in prayer. Our Heavenly Father and Eternal God, we come before Thee in the Saviour's all-worthy and all-precious name. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. We rejoice, O God, that Thy Word is truth. And Father, we pray, O God, that Thou wilt be pleased, Lord, just to draw alongside and to bless us at this time. Lord, we need thy help. We confess, O oh God, without thee we can do nothing. Therefore, Lord, we pray for thy people that thou wilt encourage us and thou wilt help us in the word tonight. Lord, above all, we pray that Jesus Christ will be uplifted, that in all things he will have the preeminence. And Lord, thy people will be encouraged in what we have and all we have in Jesus Christ. We pray as well for Vianney. Lord, without Christ as Saviour, O Lord, we pray at the end of this meeting that they will come and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be their Saviour and to forgive all their sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The details in this chapter, in 2 Samuel chapter 24, are also recorded in 1 Chronicles 21. And in the opening verses of 2 Samuel 24, David has sinned by numbering the people of Israel. Now remember, there are other times in God's word when numbering the people was not counted as sinful, such as Moses in Exodus chapter 30, verse 12, or Nehemiah chapter 7, and Ezra chapter 2. And yet here we have in this portion of scripture, that we read in 2 Samuel chapter 24 that David has sinned by numbering the people. Now, while there are many suggestions as to why David numbering the people is called a sin, the most predominant view would be that David sinned by pride, that David was putting more trust in the numbers of the army that he had in battle instead of depending upon the Lord himself. And I said there are many other opinions on that matter. We learn from First Chronicles chapter 21 and the first one that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And yet we have here in 2 Samuel chapter 24 verse 1 that God moved David uh, against them to say go number Israel and Judah. And so while in comparing the two portions together there is no contradiction. Satan provoked and tempted David uh, to sin yet David was responsible uh, for his own sin. He could blame none other. He could not blame Satan. While Satan tempted, while Satan provoked, yet David, uh, by the help of the Lord, uh, could have depended upon the Lord to give victory. 
Yet we understand in taking the two together that God was over, it was in control of the whole situation. For Satan could only do what God permitted. We learn this also, don't we, from the life of Job, that Satan was permitted by God to touch Job, but uh, Satan could only do what God permitted and no further. So God is not the author of sin, nor does God tempt any man to sin. However, God is over the actions of men. God is in control of every situation. And all things he does, all things he permits, all things he is over, is for his own sovereign purpose and his own glory. We learn in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 that God is faithful. And so in every testing, in every temptation uh, that is by Satan, though permitted by the Lord, God makes a way of escape from that temptation. God has provided all that we need in order uh, to uh, resist the devil and he will flee from us. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so God makes a way of escape However, when we fall into sin, it's our own responsibility. We have failed to heed God's word. Whenever Satan provoked and tempted David, we learn that God sent Joab to give David counsel. We read in verses 3 to 4, Joab says, Why doth my Lord delight in this thing? And Job, Joab began to try to tell David to direct him not to go down this route of numbering the people. And we learn in verse 4, notwithstanding, the king's word prevailed against Joab. David refused to listen uh, to Joab's words, his counsel, his advice. And by doing so, David fell into sin. And there is a lesson there, child of God, for us. Whenever we do not take heed to God's word, whether it's read or whether it is preached, if we disregard God's word, we will fall into sin. O oh, God has given us all we need by his word and by the preaching of his word. Therefore, we must hide his word in our hearts that we might not sin against him. Or else we become as David in not listening to those who God sends our way with a message. Remember Adam and Eve. God had given them his word. What they were to do, what they were not to do. And Satan came and tempted them. And they fell into sin. They disobeyed God's command. They are responsible for their own sin. Oh, Satan put a doubt on God's word. God said, thou shalt not. Ye shall surely die. But Satan came and questioned that. And so Adam and Eve fell into sin by disobeying God's word. However, the Lord gave them the promise of a redeemer. And the Lord clothed them by the shedding of precious blood. And we're so glad for that day when the word of the Lord came on to them and there was redemption, there was forgiveness from sin. And therefore, child of God tonight, as we think about David, because David was a child of God and he had fallen into sin, aren't you glad when the Lord comes with a word. Because here we learn in verse 11. The word of the Lord came on to the prophet God. David seer saying. God sent God with a word to David. And what a blessing that was child of God. The Lord has a word for us. Oh when we have sinned. When we have failed him. When we have grieved him. He comes with a word to us. 
by the preaching of the word, by the reading of the word. God has a word for you. And it is a word that draws you to cleansing. A word that draws you to his son. There is cleansing from sin. The Lord doesn't want you to live a defeated life. The Lord does not want you to live a life down and out. Oh, the Lord uh, wants you to live that life of victory. But there's victory through the blood. There's victory through the cross. And therefore, David had sinned. And now, the Lord, the word of the Lord came on to the prophet God, David Seer, saying, God sent his man with a word for David. And maybe there's one here tonight, you've fallen into sin. Child of God, you've been living in sin. You have not been reading your Bible. You've not been praying. You've been doing all sorts. But God, tonight, the word of God has come on to you. And the Lord wants you to have your sin cleansed. And go on and go forward for him. Maybe there's one listening here tonight, you're not saved. I'm glad the word of the Lord comes to you in your sin. To let you know that there is mercy with the Lord. There is forgiveness with him. You can have your sin pardoned, covered over this night, if you come to him by faith. We want to look at this chapter this evening as the testimony of God. Notice first of all, there is God's ministry to David. Verse 11 and 12. The word of the Lord came on to the prophet God. David seer saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord. Now the word seer and the word prophet, they refer to the same description. They mean a spokesman or one who sees. The same word is used in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, and let us go to the seer, for that he is now called a prophet, was before time called a seer. And so there you see how the word there is used. It emphasizes the mark of the prophetic office in spiritual matters. And so to put it like this, God is David's spiritual counselor. God is David's seer. God is David's prophet. And therefore, he has a ministry towards David, given to him by the Lord. It's clear from 1 Samuel chapter 22 that God was with David for a long time, even back there in the cave of Adullam. And in verse 5, uh, even in that same chapter, of 1 Samuel chapter 22 that God had a word for David by God. So once again now in 2 Samuel chapter 24 the word of the Lord came on to the prophet God. Once again God has a word for David by his seer, by his prophet. God communicated his word directly to his prophets, directly to God, He put his word in their mouths. And as they spoke, as they ministered, as they gave out the word of God, they spoke as thus and thus saith the Lord. In other words, when God spoke to David, God delivered what God had given him. God just didn't speak whatever came to mind. God just didn't approach David and decide to make something up there and then. Rather, God came to David. Yea, God was sent to David with the word of the Lord. Now today we do not have seers on prophets, even apostles. In other words, that God does not communicate his word audibly and directly as he did in Bible times. The reason being, God, revelation of himself is recorded in his word. We have the complete canon of scripture. And therefore, we don't depend upon dreams. We don't depend upon 
an audible voice coming from heaven. Any word that God will speak to any man concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, concerning their sin, concerning their present situation, God will do it through his word, whether it is read privately, publicly or preached. But it will come from the word of God. That's why Paul, whenever Paul preached the gospel, Paul always made the point, as he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 4, For I delivered on to you, first of all, that which also I have received. And so Paul is saying, what I'm preaching to you, what I'm declaring to you, it's not my message, it's not what I've made up, it's not what I've dreamed up. I am only giving you what the Lord has given me. And what was that message? How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And therefore, when God's man comes with God's word, he doesn't direct people to himself. See, that's the difference today. Those who come with words saying, I've had a dream from God, or I've had this hallucination, or my window shook last night and God spoke to me. What they're doing, they're drawing attention to themselves. However, when God's man truly comes, he comes with God's word. And what does he do? All the attention is brought upon the Lord, upon his person, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And therefore, while we don't have seers today, prophets today, apostles today, yet we can take the application, the principles of their office. And that is whenever we speak a word, it must be, as we speak a word from God, it must be according to his word. And therefore, child of God, I encourage you, to pray for your preacher. That Lord's Day by Lord's Day. He will not just come with a sermon. But he will come with the word of God. He will come with a message from the Lord. And he will come with a message from God. That will always draw us to the Saviour. May he be the Lord's messenger. On the Lord's Day. May he speak as 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And therefore, the man who brings forth God's word will always do so to speak as thus and thus saith the Lord, and also that God will be glorified through Christ. That in all things, Christ may have the preeminence. And such a message that is delivered by the Lord will only be delivered by the power of the Holy Ghost. A word from God will always direct the hearer to Christ's sinless life and his atoning death. As the only redeemer of God's elect. And all he has done for them. All he is doing for them. And what he has yet to do for them. Whenever he gloriously returns for them. It's interesting to note in. Acts chapter 2. Verses 29 and 30. In Acts chapter 2. Verses 29 through 30. David is spoken of as being a prophet. And isn't that Interesting. Here the prophet needs a prophet. The one who is anointed king to lead a nation described as a prophet also needed a prophet. Also needed to hear the word from God. And therefore there is a lesson there for even preachers. Preachers need a preacher. Preachers too as they give out and give out and give out, must make sure they're hearing God's word as well. 
as it is preached. But also, we say today, as we think of those in position, whether our Prime Minister, whether the Royal Family, those in higher authority, those in a position of power, they need to hear a word from God. They need a preacher who will tell them, direct them in spiritual matters. Why we need to pray this day that God will raise up one who will have the Prime Minister's ear. One who will have the Royal Family's ear. Who will not direct them uh, to wishy-washy Christianity where everything goes and anything is acceptable. But that will lead them as John the Baptist was to had a ministry of preparing a people for the coming of the Lord. And why have he prepared people for the first coming in a sense, the second coming? So we prepare people for the second coming of the Lord. Oh, we pray that God will raise up a child of his. That even as the Saviour himself in Luke chapter 2 verse 52, he had favour with God and with men. And as the word of God is preached, may it be as 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8, that it is sounded out from the, this place. And then as 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1, that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. And therefore we pray that God will raise up such that as the word of God has sounded forth Lord's day by Lord's day and yea even into the palace even into the offices that God's word will be sounded forth will have free course and be glorified. God had a ministry to David and that was to give him the word of God. And therefore, believer, your minister has a, mess, has a ministry for you. And that is to give you the word of God. If you are in a church or listening online to your service, wherever you listen to, and your minister is not ministering to you the word of God, you need to leave that place and get to somewhere where you are sitting under the true preaching of God's word, where you can leave Lord's Day by Lord's Day, knowing I've had a word from God. So God's ministry to David, he came with God's word, the word of the Lord. He was sent by the Lord. Notice secondly, God's message to David. God's message to David is the same message that is preached today. Sin is confronted in order to have sin cleansed. Notice three simple thoughts under God's message to David. God's message to David spoke of the consequences for sin. You see, God's message to David showed that God was a faithful preacher of the word of the Lord. God did not change the message. God had given God a message to give to David. And therefore he had a ministry to perform before David. But God did not change to think, well I'm going before King David. I need to lighten this down a bit. I need to, 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 to change this a bit. I need to make it a bit more pleasing. No, God did not seek to change the message. He did not seek to please David's ear. He did not try to accommodate David. David had sinned. And therefore God was to come to David. And let him know. That his sin. Had been noted by the Lord. God would come. And confront and challenge David's sin. According to the word of God. Verse 13. So God came to David and told him. Those are key words. He told him what God told him to tell him. God told David. God's word. God's word as delivered by God. It confronted 
David's sin. It confirmed that David's sin was found out. And therefore David learned that there would be consequences for his sin. David's sin affected the nation. David's sin was Israel's sin. It brought the consequences of the death of 70,000 men. David's sin had consequences for the nation. Just as we learn in Joshua chapter 7, whenever the Lord's people were going into battle, and as they went with the Lord, they would know victory. But if there was sin in the camp, they would not know victory. We learn that whenever they went up to battle, they were defeated. Why? Because there was sin in the camp. Achan had sinned. And so Achan's sin brought consequences upon the whole uh, company of God's people. Upon the nation, I think of Adam and Eve's sin. Whenever they sinned, God feud and treated all mankind in Adam. Adam was the covenant head, our legal representative. And so he stood for us. And God gave him that command not to eat off the fruit. For the day whereof thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. And so Adam stood for us. His success would be our success. His failure would be our failure. And therefore God feared and treated all mankind in Adam. And so when Adam sinned, we fell and we sinned in Adam. And bearing the consequences of sin. Paul said also in Galatians 5 verse 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Just a little bit can spread, can affect everything. So in the believer's life, because remember David is a believer, there is consequences for sin. And that consequences came in the form of chastisement. We learn, don't we, uh, from verses 12, uh, on down that that God said to David uh, uh, the Lord said to David go and say unto David thus saith the Lord I offer thee three things choose one of them that I may do unto thee and so David was given three choices and these choices were to come as a form of chastisement it was the rod of God but in sending this chastisement, God was sending this chastisement in order to bring restoration, in order to draw David back to himself. God was not sending this chastisement for David and others to go further and further and further into sin or to keep on sinning. Rather, as David said in one of his Psalms, it is good that I have been afflicted for then I had learned my statutes. In other words, when we are chastised for sin, it is the Lord getting our attention back on him. And while the Lord will always forgive our sin, yet he does permit, he does allow the consequences of that sin to remain. And so while, as we will learn later, God forgive, but the consequences still lasted in the death of 70,000 men. And so God was teaching David through his prophet God that God will not allow his justified people to depend upon the arm of the flesh. God will not allow his redeemed people who are called by his name uh, to live in sin to depend upon the arm of the flesh or to harbor thoughts that I can get away with this sin or I am untouchable or because I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace because I belong to the Lord I can live as I please. And God will not take any notice of my sin. And how many today think the same? David's sin brought a heavy consequence upon the, nat upon the nation because David couldn't choose he left it over to the Lord's mercy. And we learn the Lord in verse 15 sent a plague. 
So the Lord sent pestilence, a, a disease, upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. God permitted chastisement by this plague, this disease, to sweep through the nation because one man's sin. This disease, this pestilence was sent, permitted by God to correct David's sin, to confront his sin, to correct his sin and to draw David back to himself and others. Interesting to note, here in our land in England, Thomas Brooks, a mighty man of God, spoke or wrote about a plague in London in the year 1665. And in his own account of that plague, and you can type it in on the internet, and Thomas Brooks, the plague of London, 1665, you'll get all the details there. But he likened that plague to the chastising rod of God. And he wrote, God's purpose and end of taking up the rod. And he recognised that God permitted that plague according to his own divine purpose to correct and to restore his people and for the furtherance of the gospel. Oh yes, the nation or London bore the consequences. But the Lord was pleased to use it for his own glory. We can certainly say this Coronavirus is a form of chastisement. The Lord is working out his own purposes. He has been pleased to send it for his own glory and drawing his people back to himself. In the furtherance of the gospel, has there not been recorded during this time, there has been more opportunities going forward to reach others in the gospel than we had known before. Churches that have used this time to have ministries to reach those who are not able to get to God's house through sickness or illness or whatever situation it may be. And other ways, souls have been saved. God's people have been restored. And so God does all things for his own glory, his own honour. He sends these chastisements. To correct his people, confront their sin, correct them, and draw them to himself. As Ezra prayed in bondage and captivity, a little reviving in our bondage. Therefore, child of God, I must be honest with you in delivering God's word to you. God will not allow you to continue in your sin. God will not allow you to continue in life without not reading his word or not praying, skipping church. God will bring you to that point of chastisement. He'll bring you to that point where you will have to be still and know that he is God. There, dear, therefore, believer, we learn in First Peter chapter 4, verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, a verse that has been preached on many times throughout this coronavirus and even prayed. The Lord says, If my people, which are called by my name, in other words, those words signify the people that bear my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Now we think that's normal, isn't it? To pray and seek. But notice the next words. And turn from their wicked ways. Now that's God's people. If my people, those that bear my name, my redeemed, they humble themselves, they pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven 
and well notice forgive their sin and heal their land and I say to you men and women today the answer for this pandemic this time that we're going through is the gospel it's the Lord it's God's people getting back to the Lord therefore child of God the Lord uses this as he did in David's life to draw him also unsaved when I must be faithful to you because the consequences in your life of sin is and will lead to eternal condemnation. Oh, how many there are today who think that they can live for God, that they can live this life as they please. And when it comes to their death, God will overlook sin. God will weigh their good works and their bad works. And the good works will just outshine the bad works. And God will just bypass them. You hear these phrases today. Well God just loveth a trier. And if you try your best. God will let you into heaven. And that's not a word from God at all. That's deceptive. To think you can get to heaven by your own works. Your own ways. Your own deeds. And yet refuse God's one way. I tell you you will perish in sin. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 verse 27. It is appointed unto men once to die. The word appointed means it's reserved. It's established. The day of your death is set. You don't know it. But God does. But after this the judgment. And if you live without Christ. And you die without Christ. You will face him not as your saviour. But as your judge for sentencing. And eternal damnation. One day the Lord Jesus Christ will come back gloriously. And he's not coming back to die. He's coming back in all his glory to rule and reign. Or we should say continue his rule and reign. The king is coming back. As Matthew 25 verse 32 says. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from the other, as a sheep divideth his sheep from the goats. The sheep and the goats separated, divided. The goats represent the unsaved. Those who remain in their natural condition, their lost estate, who have rejected Christ the Saviour, who has rejected God's one way of forgiveness. Verse 41 of Matthew 25. Then shall he say unto them on the left. That's the goats. The unsaved. Depart from me ye cursed. Into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Oh you will bear the torments of hell. You will await that final judgment. That after the millennial reign of Christ. Revelation 20 verse 13 to 15. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I tell you what, you can have your name written on a marriage certificate. You can have your name written on a church Attendance, a record name, whatever it may be, a baptism certificate. But if your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will face a lost eternity. God's message spoke to David about the consequences of his sin. You see, God will always punish sin. But he either punishes sin upon the sinner themselves in a lost eternity or upon the sinner's substitute at the cross of Calvary but God will always punish sin and that leads us then to God's message to David spoke of the cleansing from sin you see verse 18 God's message spoke about cleansing from sin and God came that day to David and said unto him go up and rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Sin in the life of God's people will hinder fellowship with God. 
Isaiah 59 verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you. That he will not hear you. And so sin must be cleansed. And notice God directs David to the place of cleansing. Rear an altar on to the Lord in the threshing floor. What was the threshing floor? The word threshing means to trample to beat. It was the place where the harvest was gathered. It was the place of separation. Threshing floors were usually upon a hill uh, for the winnowing process where the grain was separated from the chaff as it was thrown up and the wind would separate them. Take the chaff away. Take that which was of no use. The blow it away. Separate it away. And keep that which was good. And therefore, and we can see wonderful pictures here, can't we? Between the death of Christ and the return of Christ. The place of separation. But at this threshing floor, David was to build an altar unto the Lord. A place of sacrifice. Why? So verse 21 states that the plague may be stayed from the people. This plague, this disease. Verse 25. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Now the word altar means to slay or to slaughter. So here is a place of slaughter. Here is a place of sacrifice. Sacrifice unto the Lord. These offerings were unto the Lord. Because sin is against the nature of God. God is holy. God is light. And in him is no darkness. As 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 states. Or as Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. Tells us that God is of pure eyes to behold evil. And therefore God has provided cleansing. From sin. Covering over sin. God does not give men a bypass. God does not change the standard. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The penalty for breaking God's law is death. And therefore God does not sweep sin under the carpet. God does not say I need to make up another way. No Sinners are not saved by God's law being set aside or something else in place. Sinners are saved by God's law being upheld, honoured. So God provided a covering, a cleansing, a perfect righteousness for man. His sin in the Lord Jesus Christ because no man can approach God in their sin. They must come through cleansing. They must come through a sacrifice. And that's what God was teaching in the Old Testament. In the, these Levitical offerings. And we have two of them here. The burnt offering and the peace offering that are mentioned. And in the Old Testament, these offerings were object lessons. To teach spiritual truth. Symbolic truth. That the people back then in the Old Testament, they were to look forward by faith to what these offerings represented, who they represented. So for instance, all the sacrifices of the burnt offering and peace offering, those sacrifices in themselves could not save. Those animals that were offered up, their blood was shed, could not save but what the Israelite was to do was to look at what they represented, who they represented, and put their faith and trust in who they represented. And so God was teaching by these object lessons, these offerings, that the sinner's acceptance with him is by or on the ground of a sinless substitutionary sacrifice. That God has appointed and accepted. And that one sacrifice is Jesus Christ. And so we learn that Jesus Christ. As would 
David would have been taught and the Israelite would have been taught that Jesus Christ is our burnt offering. Jesus Christ is our peace offering. The burnt offering is recorded in Leviticus chapter 1. There you have the word burnt means that which ascends or to ascend up. Where you get the word holocaust. The whole animal was offered up upon the altar. And it was completely consumed. The animal that was to be offered was to be without blemish. That means without fault. It had to be a perfect offering. Its blood was shed. It was willingly put on the altar. And again, remember, it spoke of Jesus Christ, who is the lamb without blemish. He is without fault. In him is no sin. He willingly offered himself as a sacrifice. He laid down his life as the sinner's substitute. He willingly gave himself and was completely offered up himself to bear our sins on his own body on the tree. So the burnt offering spoke of the whole life and death of Jesus Christ, but in particular, it focused upon his sufferings, his substitutional sufferings. He was wounded and bruised for our transgressions. He suffered at the hands of men and he suffered at the hands of God for it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And then Leviticus chapter 3 is the peace offering. It followed the same process as the burnt offering. But the peace offering was to teach the benefits resulting from the burnt offering. And that was peace. And so the Israelite learned that as he offered up this offering, he was being taught that he had peace with God through the sinless substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. These burnt offerings and the peace offerings that were offered up, they were sweet-smelling savours unto the Lord. Now, what does that language mean? Well, it doesn't mean that the burning of the flesh of animals pleased the Lord. But rather, because it ascended up, it was language to teach that God was satisfied, that God was pleased with that sacrifice that he had appointed and was offered up. We see this language used in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour, a savour of rest. In other words, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross, God was satisfied. And so this is the whole picture that David has as God's messenger is by God is given to David. He is to go to the the threshing floor, to the altar. And offer up burnt offerings and peace offerings. And it directed his mind by faith to look forward to the promised Saviour. To look forward to the place of justification, propitiation. Now what does justification mean? It simply means to be declared righteous. It's God declaring a sinner righteous, forgiven, justified, completely pardoned. All sins forgiven. Propitiation, what does that mean? It means to turn away God's wrath by means of an atoning sacrifice or a sacrifice that covers over sin. And so at this threshing floor, when David offered up these sacrifices, his mind was directed upon to Calvary, Mount Calvary. To the place of sacrifice, to the altar at Mount Calvary, where Jesus Christ was his burnt offering to sacrifice himself, to be his substitute, to bear all his sin, to satisfy God in order to give peace with God, secure peace with God by his precious blood. And therefore, Jesus Christ is the sinless Savior who offered himself to God he is our sinless substitute. His precious blood 
has secured, has secured peace with God. Propitiation, turning away God's wrath against all those who believe in him by faith. First John 1 verse 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleansing us from all sin. Romans 5 verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1 20, we have peace through the blood of his cross. And therefore in this plague, in this time of death, in this time of chastisement, where the consequences of sin is uh, shown, revealed, God's man is sent with a message from God to direct David to the place of cleansing, to the altar, to the shedding of blood, to the place where Jesus Christ has secured forgiveness for his people. That's why Charles Spurgeon, speaking in his day about uh, a virus, a plague that swept through London, he encouraged Christians and pastors. He said this, I quote, Tell them of Calvary and its groans and cries and sweat of blood. Tell them of Jesus hanging on the cross to save sinners. Tell them that there is life for a look in the crucified one. Oh, Spurgeon wanted men and women to know in this time of uh, virus, this time of a plague, look to Jesus Christ. And that's the same today. During this time of pandemic, during this time of disease, just as David was directed by God, get to the altar, get to the place of sacrifice, get to the person of Jesus Christ. So we are to tell men and women, get to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is able to save all who will come unto him by faith. God, God pointed David to the cleansing from sin by the sinless life and the substitutionary blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, believer, Jesus Christ is our burnt offering, our peace offering, yea, he is our altar. And therefore, there is cleansing through him. Well, you've let down the Lord today, child of God, you've sinned. The Lord doesn't want you to live to beat it life down and out. Oh, there's no point reading my Bible. No point going to church. I've let the Lord down. Don't become like Peter. Oh, I'm going to walk afar off. I'm going to go back to fishing. Going back to what I used to do. No, come. There's cleansing from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses. His blood feels for me. But notice also God's message to David spoke not only of the consequences of sin, the cleansing from sin, but the covering from sin. Because verse 21, notice the whole point of this, that the plague may be stayed from the people. Verse 25, so the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. The word stayed means to withdraw or to restrain. And the whole point of God's chastisement for sin was that, uh, that it was withdrawn. Why was it withdrawn from David and the nation? Because it fell upon the sacrifice. And here is propitiation. You see, David deserved the wrath of God. None of us deserve mercy. If God was to mark uh, iniquity, none would stand. And therefore David realised that day he deserved the wrath of God to fall upon him. But in getting to the cross, in getting to the altar, there he saw God was pleased with that sacrifice. And all forgiveness from sin the covering over of sin was because the payment for sin was made. The wrath of God should have fallen upon David, should have fallen upon the nation. 
but instead it fell upon the sacrifice. And therefore, because it fell upon the sacrifice, David's sin was forgiven. And remember this here, child of God. Sins put away by Christ will never be sin rediscovered or recovered by Christ. Once our sin has been covered over, atoned over, put behind his back, it will never be brought to view. We'll never give an account for it. We'll never be sentenced to hell for it because Christ will never demand payment twice. The payment was made by the precious blood. And therefore, David was to go to the place of cleansing for their sin was covered over because the sacrifice took his place. Therefore, there is now, as Romans 8 verse 1 states, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What a message that was for David. The start of this chapter, David had sinned. But now God sends his man with a message to David. Get to the place of cleansing, because there is the place where sin is covered over. By faith in the substitute. By faith in the blood. By faith in the way God has accepted. And I say to you, child of God, come for cleansing. I say to you, unsaved one, come don't try to do more. Don't try to get more religion. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and he will save you. Notice finally and briefly, God's mission for David. God sent David with a mission. Verse 18, go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went and he purchased uh, this site and the surrounding land. And again, Second Samuel 24 and First Chronicles 21, uh, the two prices, the price of, uh, of the land, uh, everything's all included, the site and the land. So David bought the site and the land around the area as well. Remember, whenever Israel entered into the land of promise, the place of worship was established in Shiloh where the tabernacle was situated. We learn in Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 5 through to 7 that God had ordained that sacrifices offered to him should be offered uh, by all Israel in one particular place. And so God is leading up to that place. That place would become what was known as the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. So this would be the place, because remember, up to this stage, Israel dwelt in the tabernacle, which was a tent, temporary tent. And whenever they moved, it was taken down and it moved with them in the wilderness and then in Israel. But now they need God required a more permanent structure to be built and there you have the building of Solomon's temple and we learn in the scriptures and we'll come to the first in a minute but this place of the threshing floor of Aruna is the place where Solomon's temple would be built that temple that was a permanent structure for God's people to meet with God and God to meet with his people but it was also the same place where uh, Mount Moriah, where Abraham offered up his son Isaac. Let me give you the reference. Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Second Chronicles 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. Now what happened in Mount Moriah? That is the place where Abraham, Genesis 22, was again another picture of the cross, another picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham would offer up his only begotten son Isaac on the altar of sacrifice. But the Lord intervened and provided a sacrifice in the place of Isaac. So there's substitution. 
and the ram it was offered in the place of Isaac so Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in, at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah where the Lord now here's the, again where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan now that's the same name I just uh, wrote differently the Jebusite so Ornan or Aruna uh, there are other ways to say the name as well but we'll not get into that so we see this one place God has told David now remember God's a prophet as well so God has told David instruct him go to this altar but in this place David buys it and that was the place where Abraham would, was, would take up Isaac on Mount Moriah it was the same place later that David was motivated to build the house of God which we learn that Solomon then built him not David but on that place right now on that place where the threshing floor of Aruna was where Solomon's temple was where uh, Abraham would have offered Isaac today where, where does there stand because remember the temple was destroyed well today there is a dome a golden dome you ever go to Israel you see pictures there is this temple this dome uh, type sort and that belongs to the Muslims now I don't know how but we learn in scripture that when Christ returns to earth or just before Christ returns to earth let me say to continue his rule in his real reign the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt so that means this dome where that is there now that will be destroyed that will be gone how I don't know but that dome will be gone and there will be a new temple built and in that temple we learn in Matthew 24 verse 15 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 but in that place there will be one who is the Antichrist who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God and he will show himself that he is God and there will be that abomination of desolation set up and yet we learn that when the Lord comes back he will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming and that temple as well will be destroyed and then the Lord will establish his millennial temple as you will read in Ezekiel chapter 40 through to 48 all the dimensions of that as I sa as Zechariah chapter 6 verses 12 to 13 states he shall build the temple of the Lord he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne and so there is the glorious day when Christ will come back and we shall rule and we shall reign with him we shall be forever with the Lord oh what a glorious day that will be child of God when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord so many wonderful things but I must say this in closing until that time comes we must be busy about our father's business child of God we must know that there's forgiveness with the Lord there's cleansing in the blood we must ever look forward to the coming and glorious appearing the blessed hope of Christ and as we look for his coming we must always seek to bring others with us to seek to see others one for the gospel because if they die outside of Christ they will enter a lost eternity and therefore I pray as we looked at this chapter today we find that the Lord's coming for the believer is a glorious day but for the ungodly it will be a day of terror because it will be a day of sentence oh I pray that God will bless us as we've looked at this chapter today and as I said you we could split this chapter into many many weeks and there's so much material here hope you've learned something hope you've got something out of it hope it's been a word from God to your soul and we pray the Lord will undertake and write his word upon 
uh, our hearts for his name's sake. Amen. We do want to thank our brother, Mr. Knowles, uh, for his message this evening. We want to assure him of the blessing and the help that it has been uh, to our hearts. We do appreciate his ministry in the meeting this evening. We appreciate him uh, being involved uh, in these uh, monthly meetings. Uh, We're glad of his fellowship and his support. Uh, We're thankful to him for opening up the Word of God. Uh, We pray that the Lord will lead us on with himself as a result of what we've heard tonight from uh, the Scriptures. May the Lord be pleased to give us grace to remain faithful uh, to him just in these very dark days in which we live. And may our brother himself be encouraged as he hears messages and reports of how the Lord has uh, used his ministry, used uh, the message that is brought to our hearts and our souls uh, tonight. The closing hymn this evening is the hymn, The Lord is Coming By and By. Be ready when uh, he comes. Uh, What a challenge that is, both to the saint and to the sinner. May the Lord bless us as we sing the words of our closing hymn uh, together. Let's just seek the Lord's face in prayer. We're going to...
commit the meeting uh, just to the Lord now, all that has taken place. We want to close the meeting in prayer. So let's just lift our hearts to him. Father, we're conscious that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. We know that we need your blessing upon our efforts and upon our labors. And we thank you for the gathering tonight, for every part. Thank you for your presence. We thank you, Father, for bringing uh, so many of us together uh, from various parts, from various lands, even in this way, in this uh, means. We thank you, Father, for the technology that enables us to join together uh, around the Word of God. How we thank you for the going forth of the Scriptures, even all around the globe uh, tonight. And we pray that you'll bless this message, bless our brother that has brought it to us, encourage him in his labors. Thank you for his faithfulness uh, down there in the south of England, the witness that has been raised for the gospel. We pray, Father, that you'll encourage him, give him tokens for good. Pray that you'll send in new people, uh, send in new families uh, to the congregation there, uh, even in, in coming days. And Lord, we ask thee, give us a deeper love for the scriptures. Even as we considered a little earlier, help us, Father, to be diligent in our study of thy word, reading uh, through all of uh, the, the revelation that you have been pleased to give uh, to us. And Lord, open the scriptures to us. We would cry, that which I see not, uh, teach thou me. So here, these are prayers. And we just ask thee, Father, for your very evident blessing to be upon all that has taken place tonight. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be our abiding portion, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.